As we ventured through the dark, terrifying and forgotten world of Rapture, it was clear that whilst it looked beautiful from the outside, inside it was the complete polar opposite. Corruption and greed littered the streets as its population killed each other over the precious resource of Adam. It would have appeared like Rapture had all the ideologies of a world that was like a utopia, but realistically it was doomed to fail from the start. It would also seem like Rapture was one of a kind, the only city that had something unique about it aesthetically and ideology wise. It seemed like this city was the only one away from any form of mainland with its own set of rules, or lack of. However, within the skies above America, there was to be another city, run by another man connected via another lighthouse. As our lead, Booker DeWitt, looks to find the girl to help wipe away the debt, he would discover this beautiful, almost holy land called Columbia that was bold in colour, had floating houses, streets and markets, and embraced the true, pure American ideology. This city looked and felt like the best of America, a heavenly place where everyone was happy and it seemed like nothing bad ever happened. However, like with Rapture, a darker secret was hidden away by their so-called prophet, known as Zachary Hale Comstock. Strict ideologies, horrible segregation and outright torture went on behind the golden gates of its city. To their society, however, this was how it was meant to be. As Booker DeWitt ventures on through this land, more and more mysterious things would be uncovered and more and more would be revealed to him thanks to the girl known as Elizabeth. But why was Columbia found? What was its sole goal? Who was Prophet Comstock? What did he want? And how did Columbia eventually fall? Well, in today's video, we look at the world of Columbia and explore its complex timeline. This is the rise and fall of Bioshock Infinite's Columbia. Our story starts with one man born under the name of Booker DeWitt. Booker was born on the 19th of April 1874 and was of partial Native American descent. Not much is known of Booker in his early years, however at the age of just 16 he would go on to join the 7th Cavalry Regiment within the United States Army. Almost instantly after joining the regiment, Booker was sent to the Wounded Knee Creek within South Dakota in 1890. Here a horrific event would take place between American soldiers and a Native American tribe known as the Lakota people. Here the American soldiers went on to massacre nearly 300 of the tribe in cold blood simply because the tribe didn't give up their weapons as they said they had paid a lot of money for them and fear for the soldiers own safety as some of the Native Americans performed a ritual called the ghost dance which was part of their religion which the soldiers saw as an act of aggression. The Lakota outraged by the actions of the army who were only there to supposedly disarm the tribesmen hit back but were outnumbered and now outgunned as the soldiers soldiers had taken most of their weapons. In the end, more than 250 men, women and children of the Lakota tribe had been killed and 51 were injured, which again included women and children. During this, American soldiers were also injured in the fight with 25 soldiers being wounded and 33 dying within the battle occurring after the massacre. During this time, Booker was accused of being a Native American descent by his sergeant in front of all the other soldiers of his platoon and because of it held too much sympathy for these supporters supposed savages. To avoid being held prisoner or despised by the rest of his fellow soldiers, Booker had to prove that he wasn't on the tribe's side and was actually a true American soldier. Here he played his part in the massacre and scalped Native American victims as well as burnt down teepees that still had men, women and children inside of them. The fellow soldiers surrounding him watched as he took these actions and eventually Booker was nicknamed by soldiers like Cornelius Slate the White Injun as he took trophies from his victims. After the massacre, massacre of Wounded Knee had come to a close, Booker was awarded along with other soldiers the Medal of Honor by the American government and was promoted to Staff Sergeant. Booker was a hero. He was praised not only by his country but by his fellow soldiers as well. However, for Booker, he left that massacre feeling ashamed and regretted playing a part in killing innocents. It took Booker ages to get over what he had done, unable to sleep at night and even look himself in the eye. Eventually Booker attended a river baptism led by Preacher Whitting to help him be reborn as a new man and to be forgiven for his sins. Preacher Whitting accepted his want to be baptised and proceeded with it. After that fateful day Booker found faith in Christianity and wanted to live every day following its teachings. He also wanted to 
change who he was as a person and because of it changed his name from Booker DeWitt to Zachary Hale Comstock. Booker was a new man and with his new identity continued to live under the Christian way of life, attending preachers, reading the Bible and attending church events. So inspired by everything he had learned from Christianity, Comstock would become an extremely influential preacher and would say that he had been visited by an archangel who showed him a vision of a city in the sky. Comstock said that it was his role to build that city. That was what God had intended him to do, and it were to be a place where the best of society would be, those chosen by God himself, and they would be the leading example of a godly American society that was closest to the heavens. Comstock convinced some that he was the chosen one, and that the city he spoke of was going to be a real thing. Here he spoke to the US Congress who held him in high regard, and tried to convince them to help build this city to uphold Christian and American values. He said the city would be named Columbia. Eventually, Congress agreed to fully fund this city, stating that they felt Columbia would be the best place at showing American exceptionalism. With the funding now in place, it was now time for Comstock to figure out how exactly he was going to get it to float above the American mainland. Here he met with Rosalind Lutess, a respected quantum physicist who had figured out a way to suspend an atom in midair. With her colleagues calling this process the quantum levitation, however, Rosalind preferred to call it the Lutess field. Comstock was able to convince Rosalind Rosalind to help him with this floating city, utilizing her Lutess field to help it float high in the clouds. The city had finally been created by 1893 and was displayed at the Chicago World's Fair to huge praise before being sent to the distant shores. The city the Archangel spoke of to Comstock had come true and he had done God's work. Because of this, the group known as the Founders were created and Comstock himself became their leader as well as the leader of Columbia itself. The founders were a group who believed that Columbia embodied the true society that the founding fathers had originally envisioned. This is where the Anglo-Saxons could rule over the world and they could civilize it through military might and spread their true perfect religion and culture. And with Columbia, this was their new Eden. It didn't take long before a new form of Christianity had taken center stage in Columbia, led by Comstock himself that combined a lot of traditional Christianity with the ideology of true American values. However, this brought a lot of unpleasantries with it. Racism, elitism, xenophobia, and laissez-faire business practices to name a few, started showing themselves quite frequently within the city, leading to a lot of segregation and the persecution of anyone who had a different religious belief. To Comstock, there was only one religion, and that was the pure American Christianity that he and his founders followed, with their true idols being God, as well as the founding fathers of George Washington, Thomas Jefferson, and Benjamin Franklin, who were seen as the saints of Columbia, the scroll, the key, and the sword. During this, however, Rosalind continued to work on a Lutess field, trying to see what else she could do with it. But during this time, she noticed that one of the quantum atoms she had been observing had someone observing her back, someone from another dimension. This person being her male counterpart, Robert Lutess. The two began communicating to each other through Morse code, helping each other with their experiments. Eventually, through each other's help, Rosalind was able to create the trans-dimensional machine and with it was able to open passages called tears, which could access multiple dimensions. Thanks to this creation, Comstock was able to boost himself even further and helped him to become seen as the true prophet, the man who could bring humanity into a new age and a messenger who had been sent by God himself. Comstock could do no wrong. Everyone believed everything he said and his teachings rang out all over society. But this discovery and knowledge came with a downside. Comstock liked to be around the machine a lot to see new prophecies and glimpses into new dimensions and because of it the machine's exposure rapidly aged him as well as changed his genetic traits, meaning that he quickly became sterile. Comstock and his wife however were desperate for a child, a new lamb that would lead his flock to salvation, created by his own seed. But thanks to this machine and its effects on his body, he now knew that this could not happen. He had no heir to share what he had built with, and his legacy as a prophet once he was gone would just fade away. And on top of that, without an heir of any kind, Comstock found out that the whole of his city would fall completely. 
However, using these tears, Comstock's answer would be found. Looking into one of them, Robert Lutess would see a dimension where Comstock himself was still Booker and had not gone through the baptism process. Here he was massively in debt, but had a child named Anna DeWitt. Robert, under Comstock's guidance, was sent to negotiate with Booker, stating he could wipe away the debt if he gave them the girl. Booker eventually agreed and handed over Anna. However, as Comstock and the twins were about to go back to their dimension through the tear they had just opened, Booker regretted his decision charged back to get his daughter but he was too late the tear was closing and his daughter had gone forever however thanks to his panic in the moment Anna's finger was severed off as the tear closed around her Anna had now gone from Booker's world and Comstock had now claimed his new lamb Columbia's heir Anna had now come back to Columbia with Comstock and immediately was renamed to Elizabeth and referred to as his seed that would one day take the throne of Columbia however more tears would reveal to Comstock that actually Elizabeth would be destined to destroy the surface of the world when she became the ruler. People suddenly questioned how Comstock could suddenly have an heir to the throne. However, with his influence, Comstock stated that Lady Comstock had been pregnant for just seven days and that Elizabeth was the miracle child gifted by God. Lady Comstock agreed to go along with this lie. However, by 1895, she couldn't take it anymore and threatened to expose Comstock's lie to the people of Colombia. However, Comstock couldn't have this and murdered her before she could expose him. But with this, he then couldn't have Lady Comstock's murder on his hands. He needed to come up with a new story. Comstock revealed she had been assassinated by their scullery maid, Daisy Fitzroy, and she was the murderer. But Daisy would escape the hands of Comstock and the rest of Columbia's fury and go on to set up her revolutionary faction, the Vox Populi. Lady Comstock was widely mourned by the people of Columbia as her memory was glorified like a Catholic saint. Her body treated like a holy relic would be laid to rest in her memorial shrine for people to go and visit. However, Comstock with his lies now silenced, now was able to focus on the future of his city. It was now time for Columbia to prosper. However, little did Comstock know that Columbia Columbia's independence was right around the corner, and their fate would be seen within one of the tears. As soon as Elizabeth entered the city of Columbia, it became clear that she had an extremely dangerous ability that matched the transdimensional machine. Elizabeth was able to not only see into tears, but open them up to reveal whole new worlds. Because of this dangerous ability, matched with Lady Comstock's growing paranoia that Elizabeth was the daughter of Rosalind after an affair with her husband, Elizabeth was sent to Monument Island to be imprisoned, but also to be analyzed to work out how and why she had these abilities. And realistically, what she could do with them. However, Elizabeth's abilities were so strong that throughout the whole of Columbia, tears started to form, much to the confusion of the citizens living there. But these tears opened up brand new worlds for people, and because of it, some of the citizens jumped on the opportunity to use them for their own personal gain. The Fink brothers were the first to use the tears, with Jeremiah finding the world of rapture. Here he went in and stole all of the advanced technology he could find within that world, and because of it was able to expand his company's products and create a product known as Vigors. His brother Albert also used these tears to expand his company, stealing and recording the music that he could hear from within the tears and selling them as brand new sounds for all of the citizens of Colombia. Businesses began thriving as individuals started using the tears to expand their inventories and build up their livelihoods. Colombia was experiencing their own golden age and their city was thriving thanks to these mysterious anomalies. However, for Comstock, the tears only brought him worries and added more to his paranoia. Within one of the tears, Comstock saw himself as Booker DeWitt, but this time Booker was in Columbia on a mission to steal back Elizabeth. So fearful of this event, Comstock knew he had to set something up so the people of Columbia could defend her for when this day eventually came. Comstock created a new prophecy for the city, stating that there would be a day where the false shepherd would come for his daughter and lead her astray from her destiny in becoming the new leader of Columbia and not destroying the Sodden below. With this, Comstock 
also noticed that Booker had the initials of his daughter, Anna, on his hand. Comstock used this, making it clear that the man that bore the mark was in fact the false shepherd and needed to be stopped. On top of that, the Lutes twins created the Siphon, which was designed to siphon all of Elizabeth's power, making it so she was limited in her abilities, making it so she couldn't create whole new rifts to other worlds and potentially escape. These siphons were placed within her main tower on Monument Island, the Memorial Gardens, as well as Comstock's house. Anytime Elizabeth passively used her ability, the siphon would pick it up and leech her quantum energy. Another way of being able to control Elizabeth so that one day she could live up to her potential of being heir of Columbia. With the paranoia mounting for Comstock, eventually the day came where he killed his wife, Lady Comstock, and framed it on Daisy Fitzroy. Elizabeth's past needed to be kept secret at all costs, and killing Lady Comstock was the only way. Blaming it on Daisy, Lady Comstock's personal maid helped make it believable thanks to the racist nature of society. And with Daisy being black, the people of Columbia believed Comstock's lies and accused her instantly. Daisy ran to hide in Finkton, a place filled with manual laborers who worked for Fink Industries, as well as ethnic minorities and the foreign born. After what she had been through with Comstock, Daisy was angry and set up the Vox Populi, the voice of the people, a group filled with these segregated individuals that would protest the founders and fight the inequality faced within Columbia. But as they built their forces, Comstock and Columbia were facing another problem that would see them separate from the rest of the world and America. In 1900, Columbia was sent around the world to display America's greatest. However, at this point in time, China was experiencing the Boxer Rebellion, a war between the Eight Nation Alliance, consisting of the British Empire, Russia, Japan, France, Germany, United States, Italy, and Austria-Hungary, against the Boxers and the Xing Empire. The Boxers, fearing outside influence on their society, were extremely anti-foreign, anti-Christian, and anti-imperialist, and wanted to make sure the Eight Nation Alliance did not take over their livelihoods. During this war, Colombia opened fire using its military hardware and killed multiple Chinese citizens within Beijing. Because of this attack, the rest of the world realized that Colombia was not just an American utopia within the sky, it was a piece of military hardware that could be used during invasions to great effect. The rest of the world was horrified by this discovery, and it became clear that America would lose all respect from other nations because of this. In the end, in 1902, the US government disavowed Colombia's involvement in the Boxer Rebellion and recalled the city. But Comstock was outraged by this and felt betrayed by the American government. Instantly, he claimed Colombia's independence, saying it was better than the mainland, and took the city high into the clouds, separating it from the mainland once and for all. After this, that day would be remembered every year as Colombia's true Independence Day and would be a national holiday for almost all of its citizens. But now without US involvement, Colombia needed a way to get people into its army, to make sure it was fully militarized, as that was one of its main selling points to its ideology. Here Comstock decided to make sure propaganda was spread all over the city to make sure people joined the ranks, as it was seen as the right thing to do. And if you didn't, you were a traitor to your country and a coward. Along with this, children were also indoctrinated into these beliefs through the characters of Duke and Dimwit, stating that if you don't behave in a certain way, like cleaning your father's gun or joining the Boy Scouts, you were Dimwit and stupid. Whereas if you did do all those things that tick the boxes for a military individual, you were a Duke and would succeed in life. Whilst ethnic minorities and foreigners were not allowed to join the ranks, the founders did make it acceptable for women to join the city's militia, army and its police forces, because in the end, every able body was seen to be useful for when they have to fight off against the evil foreigners who wanted to harm their land. As Columbia lived away from the USA's rule, Rosalind and Robert continued to gather their research on Elizabeth, who had been locked away on Monument Island. To entertain herself, Elizabeth gathered knowledge from books and trained herself in specific skills such as lockpicking, singing, painting, and more. Comstock also, with the fear of losing her to Booker, made Fink create a personal guard for her. Fink using his tear to rapture formed up with their scientist Dr. Yi Sushong to create the Protector program. Eventually, much to Sushong's distaste, Fink was able to create the Songbird, and using Elizabeth's DNA and genetics was able to bond it to her, meaning that it always kept her safe, and when she needed help, it always came to her aid. Now under Songbird's protection and guard, Elizabeth was truly trapped in her cage and sought escape in her world of tears. She looked to the city of Paris most of all, believing it to be one of the most beautiful sights she had ever seen hoping that one day she could make it there. But by this point in 1909, the twins Rosalind and Robert continued to conduct their
their work and observe the tears of all the different realities. Here both of them realised that Comstock's prophecies were true. Most significantly, his prophecy about Elizabeth becoming the city's ruler and eventually waging war on the world below, destroying them for good. Despite everything they had done to help Comstock, the twins could not see this happen. They did not agree with this way of things and they needed to make it so it didn't happen. Robert knew how they could do this. They would send Elizabeth back into Booker's timeline and reacquaint her with their original father. But Comstock quickly heard of their plans and immediately started to shut it down. Comstock got Fink to tamper with the Lutest device to make sure it couldn't send them back. The twins tried to work the machine but it malfunctioned in the process. But something interesting happened. The twins did not die in the event. Instead they were both sent across all realities making them completely omnipotent. With this the Lutes were able to gain new knowledge as well as new abilities to help them on their quest to save the world below from destruction. With their new abilities it was time for the twins to seek out Elizabeth's father Booker DeWitt and have him claim back his daughter to make sure the world would be safe from her and her father's wrath. The year was 1912, Columbia was now completely independent and Comstock had now lost his wife and the Lutest twins. However, with Elizabeth in his possession, under the watchful eye of the songbird, his goal of raising Elizabeth, his seed and lamb, to become his heir was still in full swing. However, in another reality, the unbaptized Booker DeWitt was working within his private investigation agency, still in debt and now without his daughter. It was here in the office where he was contacted by the Lutest twins, who convinced him to a assist them. Here they told him to go save his daughter from Comstock. However, there was a problem. Every time Booker entered the tear, a piece of himself suffered greatly. His memories and former traits would collide with one another. One would experience brain hemorrhages and false memories that would compensate for the contradictions. The Lutest twins would repeat the interaction with Booker over and over again, trying desperately for it to work. However, as the experiment went on and on, Booker eventually got confused with the process, forgetting that the girl he had to save was his own daughter and with his memory now wiped of its original goal, Booker believed his contract was to retrieve a girl from the city of Columbia as that was the only way he could pay off his debt. In total, Booker went into Columbia 122 times, each time failing and dying in the process. The Lutest twins had one more go at their experiment in a hope that finally Booker could break through and retrieve Elizabeth from Comstock and stop the prophesied events. Here Booker was brought by boat to the lighthouse off the coast of Maine on the 6th of July 1912. Completely unaware of who he is meant to meet or what Columbia is, he is sent up via shuttle rocket to witness Columbia once again, however without any knowledge that he has been there multiple times. Throughout his quest, Booker would eventually find the girl he believed to be called Elizabeth and saved her from her prison, avoiding the guard of Songbird. But in his travels, he would see the different timelines in which he played a part in. He would meet his previous soldier Cornelius Slate and experience the events of Wounded Knee all over again. Again. He would see his victory with the Vox Populi where he died for their cause, helping them to hit back against the founders. He would witness the dead walking, see a glimpse into the dark dreary future where Elizabeth is ruler of Columbia, but eventually would find Comstock on his personal war zeppelin, name the Hand of the Prophet, and kill him in the process, believing him to have just been an evil man who had captured and tortured his own daughter. By this point the Vox Populi and the founders army were at each other's throats as well as Booker's. Elizabeth and Booker now had to fight off every army they could as the floating city burned around them. However, thanks to Elizabeth's joint connection with the Songbird, thanks to Dr. Sushong and Fink's research, it was able to help give them a fighting chance and fend off all of the opposing forces, allowing them to finally escape, destroying Monument Island's statue along with the Siphon, allowing her to be able to finally use her full abilities. However, as it does, Booker loses control of the Songbird and suddenly becomes its target again. As it charges Booker once again, Elizabeth jumps to his defense by opening a tear and transporting the three to the sunken city known as Rapture. It was here where Elizabeth's full abilities came into play and suddenly, now that she was free to use the tears to transport to different worlds, she could finally work out everything that was going on. Here she revealed that in fact Booker was the cause of all of this. It was he who triggered everything as he was the one who gave Anna away in the first place. Elizabeth was his daughter. Anna, and her saving wasn't to pay off his debt, it was to change the course of history that he set in motion back 
when he first got baptised. But Comstock was now dead, Booker thought. It was over. But Elizabeth revealed this wasn't the case. For if Booker is alive, many different realities will also have a Comstock. Every time there is one, there is always another. Booker was shown where it was all started, the baptism. For the baptism was the starting point for where Booker and Comstock's realities split. It was here where he had to end things. As Elizabeth took Booker back to that time, all the other Elizabeths from different dimensions joined the baptism process to tell Booker that it needs to end here. After witnessing everything Comstock was capable of, Booker agreed it needed to end here, at the place where he was to be baptised. Elizabeth or Anna grabbed Booker and dipped him under the water, with all the other Annas holding him under. As he lay there under the water, Booker began to drown, his life fading before his very eyes. As he drowned to death, the Annas started to disappear. The timelines were healing. Comstock's timeline was being wiped. Columbia as a city, as well as an ideology, was being destroyed. And the cycle was finally coming to an end. In the end, only one Anna remained. Comstock, Booker, and Columbia were no more. The timeline was healed and the surface was free from Columbia's wrath. One simple baptism was the cause and the solution to this whole event. And with Booker drowning at this specific point in this timeline, no Comstock would be created. And with that, no ultra aggressive religion or society would be formed. No American exceptionalism. And most importantly, no Columbia would be created. However, one Anna remains, and out there in one of the doorways remains one last Comstock. It is now her job to take him out once and for all, before the cycle starts up once again. But for now, thus ends the tale of the rise and fall of the city of Columbia. Will the sun and that is the lore behind the city of Columbia, as well as the lore of Booker DeWitt and Zachary Hale Comstock. I have to admit, Bioshock Infinite's timeline is extremely complex and is so confusing at times, but I can't deny I absolutely love this game and I have to praise how bold they were to do a story that was so complex and confusing. It could have easily been a failure, but I, I really loved it personally. But let me know what you think in the comments below about it and maybe let me know what your favorite thing about Bioshock Infinite was. I hope you all enjoyed this video and if you did, why not give it a like? like and subscribe if you haven't already. I'll leave my social media links in the description below as well as my links to other playlists for if you like this type of lore slash storytelling type video. Also if you really really like this video then why not support me on Patreon or YouTube as a channel member for early access to videos as well as ad free ones. And speaking of I'd like to thank my supporters real quick. Big thanks to our big fish Duquesne 23, Sacrum, Rhino Head and Eddie, our sharks the AVP man and Connor and our four huge megalodons Sinus, Jacob Garcia, Wow such gaming and shadow sgt also big shout out to our youtube channel member our wise one jambu as well as all my amazing subscribers over on twitch all your support means the world to me and means i can make these videos for you guys so thank you so much but that is all for now thank you all for watching once again and i shall see you all in the next one cheers